Welcome to Ethics Now, a production of Penn State's Rock Ethics Institute. I'm David Price. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Ben Jones, political scientist, ethicist, and the assistant director of the Rock Ethics Institute. We'll be talking about ethics and policing in the United States, racial disparity in the use of deadly force, the slogan, defund the police, potential corrections, and ethical expectations of police in the United States. Dr. Jones is widely published around the issue of policing, including a forthcoming co-edited book called The Ethics of Policing, New Perspectives on Law Enforcement. Okay, let's get started. Ben, thanks very much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, so what got me thinking about having you on this program was a, uh, a presentation that you gave just a couple of weeks ago to Penn State School of International Affairs, uh, The Ethics of Addressing racial disparities in police deadly force. And we'll circle sort of around to that, I think, but I, I, I'd like to start off with, um, with a broader view, and that is what ethical principles should be, should be guiding uh, police and public safety at this point? For me, the, the principle that I start out with is the priorita prioritization of protecting life. And so when you look at when you actually you look at use of force policies by police, you often find that that's the first principle to start off with, that police are there to protect life. That is their number one priority. And so I think what we've we found, especially since Ferguson and the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, we find that so many police policies in place don't live up to that ideal. And so it's really thinking about how can we make that ideal actual policy and practice. And I think in addition to that, you have to take into consideration the history of policing. Policing has been complicit in racial oppression throughout US history, and it has to be proactive in addressing that and making sure that those, um, you know, it isn't continued, continuing to advance that, um, that history many cans of worms to open up the program. Uh, and I can unfortunately only answer one or ask one question at a time. Uh, and you mentioned Ferguson. Uh, Ferguson was Missouri uh, with the police killing of Michael Brown, which uh, prompted a lot of protest at that time. Um, comparing the protest at that time to the protest that the uh, killing of George Floyd uh, earlier this year prompted in Minneapolis, it seems, and the, the statistics seem to point this out, that the public did not embrace the um, Ferguson protest to a great degree. And yet they did seem to embrace uh, and demand change as a result of the George Floyd protest. What it changed between then and now, do you think? I think it's something you see often with social movements is that they build, you know, you don't win right away. It takes time to sort of build support, communicate your message. When Ferguson happened, there was a lot of information that we just lacked about the police. We had no idea, like we didn't have good data on how many people are killed by police each year. Um, the data that, that, that's that been kept by government sources was wholly inadequate. And so what you found was that after the killing of Michael Brown and Ferguson, you had much more attention on this issue. You had media organizations developing databases, keeping close track of killings by police. And, you know, I think when Ferguson happened, there was this reaction of, at least by some, you know, this is an aberration, this isn't, you know, this isn't normal. This wouldn't happen in our community. And then you had much more attention on this issue, much better, you know, much more research. And the movement that was working to bring attention to these issues and the racial disparities in policing and the violence that oftentimes communities of color face from police, um, they, they continue to do the difficult work, even when you know, the media attention, the, the, the news cycle would move on to something else. You still had sort of organizers working to bring attention to these issues. And 
when it would come back up in the news, you know, able to marshal more resources and, and really bring attention to say, you know, <laughs> these are systemic problems and there's compelling data that things need to change, that police are failing our communities um, in a number of ways and that, you know, without systemic change that this cycle is just going to continue on. So we've learned a lot, a lot since Ferguson, there's still a lot more work to do, but I think you've seen the debate change um, as there's just been better research, more attention on the issue. Ferguson was uh, 2014, here it is almost 2021. So roughly seven years ago, um, what's changed uh, in policing since Ferguson? Has anything changed? There have been some changes, not enough. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think a lot of the proposals um, that are being considered and implemented today um, were just not taken seriously six or seven years ago. So, I mean, after George Floyd, you see states um, implementing bans on chokeholds, um, requiring changes to, to um, police training and practice. Um, and you do see in some big city police departments um, where they have taken a more proactive approach to, to address training and um, make sure that police aren't using bad tactics that unnecessarily endanger life. Um, you have in some of those departments seen some positive results in terms of um, fewer deadly force incidents. Now, I don't think in many of those cases, there's still much more work to do, um, but there are some places in the country that you see um, some, some progress. And I think what's really been important with the most recent wave of protest in response to Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and others is thinking about policing and public safety in a much more holistic way and thinking about, you know, what are the social determinants that lead to violence, that lead to these incidents with police and recognizing that Police reform is, is part of what needs to happen, but that these underlying issues, lack of um, services for mental illness, um, poverty, um, homelessness, that these are all issues that we have to tackle if we wanna address these, um, address the issue of, of police violence and making sure that communities are safe. It's, it's definitely a nonlinear issue. Uh, it's not just you know knock down one thing and something and something great happens. Uh, you wrote an op-ed with uh, an associate here in the Rock Ethics Institute, Eleanor Brown, that appeared in in the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, and in it, you note that uh, many of these acts of violence on uh, part of the police are consistent with or defended as being consistent with um, policies and procedures. It seems like the police, whether it's through a fault of their own or through no fault of their own, are trained to respond to given situations in X, Y, or Z uh, manners, and that a way of fixing one of the many ways is at the very beginning with the education of how to be a police officer and what to do in a given situation. That's one. Um, is that a right uh, perspective that, I, that I'm drilling on here? Yeah, I, I think so. And so, you know, there oftentimes when we see these incidents of crash, questionable uh, killings by police or, or ones that, that um, may be frankly illegal, um, one reaction is, you know, there's, they're bad apples and, you know, that's the explanation for it. But I think what your question gets at is that there are these more systemic issues uh, about how police are trained and how they respond to, to violence and various calls that they get. And I think a really focusing on a few examples perhaps is best to illustrate this. So in the United States, police kill um, oftentimes hundreds of people a year who have 
knives, aggressors that have a knife and how they respond to those incidents is radically different than how police in other countries respond to those incidents. For instance, in the UK, many officers do not have a gun. They don't carry a gun. And so if they respond to someone who has a, an edged weapon or a blunt weapon, you know, they're not going to shoot them because they don't have a gun to shoot them. And so they've been trained in radically very different tactics in how to respond to that situation. Tactics that are much better at protecting life and being able to resolve that incident without having to resort to deadly force. Now there have been some police organizations and some police chiefs that, that have been, um, they have welcomed these sorts of reforms and try to implement them in, in their agencies. But for the most part, there's generally been resistance to it. And, there, and so you see whether it's the case here in State College, the killing of Osagi Osagi in 2019, um, or the shooting of Walter Wallace Jr. in Philadelphia, which happened more recently. Individuals um, who had a history of mental illness were experienced and um, had, a, had a knife with them. Um, a lot of people see these incidents and they say, isn't there a better way to resolve it? And for, for so long, the police were like, no, you know, this, we followed protocol, you know, we're trained if someone gets close enough to us with a knife or a club that we're supposed to shoot. And when you take a more comparative approach and you look at how police handle these sorts of situations in other places, it's clear that deadly force isn't necessary and that there are approaches, but to be able to get to a place where police aren't using deadly force in those situations, there needs to be uh, major cha changes in how police are trained and what the expectations are. They are not trained mental health experts. They are not psychologists, they are not psychiatrists. And yet increasingly, uh, almost endlessly, it seems like, we call on our police officers to um, handle mental health issues when they are not trained to do so. Yeah, and, you know, I think that policing, police will always need some training in mental health issues. Um, I don't think that's um, they're not going to be mental health professionals, but they do need some training in those issues, just given the nature of police work. Um, but I think one, one important discussion that, that really came out of the protest in 2020 was, should police be handling all these calls? You know, are there calls where other professionals would be better uh, suited to respond that have... Um, a wealth of knowledge on mental health issues, how to respond to someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis. And so you actually see um, some alternative approaches where you, you have, you know, there are police that can respond if someone's violent or they have a weapon, um, but you also have um, trained um, crisis teams that can handle a lot of these calls and you don't send police. And so you don't have, you know, an armed policeman and you know, if the situation escalates, um, can, can lead to a deadly result. Instead, you have people that are better trained in interacting with, with folks who are experiencing a mental health crisis. And so I think that is, is an approach that definitely deserves more attention. It's something that here locally is being looked at. There was, um, after the shooting last year of Osazi Osagi, um, there was a mental health task force that was formed. And part of its recommendations was to consider um, um, putting in place locally in state college um, indiv individuals with that training that can, um, that can respond to some of those calls. So it will be interesting to see how that continues to play out and if that ends up being implemented. Also coming out of 2020, uh, the, the protest after George Floyd was the, um, the slogan uh, and the concept, defund the police. Um, it was embraced and uh, touted, and uh, even in Minneapolis, I mean, they, they went along and, and, and did some defunding. Um, 
I'd like to get your, your impressions of the wording of defund the police uh, because it says some things pretty clearly to me. Defund means take away the money, mm-hmm. all of it. Defund, zero them out. That doesn't seem helpful. In fact, that seems very risky. Your impressions of defund the police and is it the best way to say these things? So there are a couple things to address. One is the the protests that resulted um, from George Floyd and um, Breonna Taylor and other incidents. It changed the conversation, and I think in, in many important ways. And one of them is thinking about, you know, when we want to improve public safety, is policing the only tool in the box? And part of the protest movement was saying that this is not the only tool in the box, that we need to think about a more holistic approach. And I think that was one of the principal motivations behind that. And it was also, um, you know, confronting, you know, especially like you look at, you know, a number of different police departments across the country sort of histories of um, racial bias and abuse of communities of color and a real lack of legitimacy for good reason for the police in, in certain communities. And, you know, I think sort of those two things together, um, you know, motivated much of this sort of movement to de- defund the police. Now, like a lot of movements, they evolve in different ways. And you actually saw um, in the 2020 election, you saw um, a number of initiatives that were successful in, in putting more resources to other initiatives that are critical for public safety outside the police. And those initiatives, the, the language sometimes looked different. And so the language was reallocate resources for public safety. And I think what that communicates, which is important to realize is that when you're putting money towards crisis intervention teams, towards services for mental health, towards homelessness, that these are all packaged together. These are all part of efforts to improve public safety. And if you have, if you sort of have the language of, okay, funds are being reallocated and but they're still going towards public safety. I think that communicates an important point. And, um, and you know, like a lot of issues um, in politics, you know, how things are worded, people react very differently to it, to it. And I think as this work continues forward, you know, it's important to make the argument of public safety involves a lot of different variables and we have to take this holistic approach to improving public safety. And I think the more that that can be communicated, um, I think the more success there'll be. Uh, House Majority Whip uh, Jim Clymer of South Carolina was was recently very critical of the sloganeering uh, around um, defund the police and uh, in his estimations as it it cost the Democrats uh, some uh, some seats, including uh, the senatorial race uh, in, in, in his South Carolina. Um, and now there's a big fight, of course, in, among the Democrats as to what, what do we do with this slogan and how does it fit uh, everywhere? Um, you mentioned the holistic and uh, you've got a, a book uh, that you've edited with um, uh, another associate in the Rock Ethics Institute, Eduardo Mendieta, coming out, The Ethics of Policing, uh, new perspectives on law enforcement. Um, I don't want you to give away the, the, whole, the whole thing, of course, uh, but I, I imagine that when you're talking about this holistic um, approach to solutions that they're embedded in that book. And, and what are some of the things that are being suggested to fix it? We've talked about a couple, but otherwise. Yes, that I mean that book addresses a, a wide range of issues, and it had we have we have we're really fortunate to have some top-notch contributors to it. Um, folks like Tracy Mears at Yale Law School; she served on 
uh, President Obama's 21st Century Task Force on Policing, or Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Um, uh, Franklin Zimring, who's uh, a leading criminologist, he wrote a very important book called When Police Kill, which looked at um, deadly force by police in the United States, as well as other countries. Um, Veshla Weaver, he's a leading political scientist at John Hopkins, and he's done some really important work looking at communities of color, their perceptions of the police, um, how their outcomes uh, vary dramatically um, in terms of how they experience police and the criminal justice system. Um, so we have some great contributors to that book and, you know, they're part of it's looking at sort of more narrow issues like police use of force and how do you, you know, what sort of interventions are successful at being able to um, reduce police deadly force. You have other contributions that look at broader questions like the legitimacy of police. How do you, um, um, what, what does police legitimacy look like in a democratic society? Um, there's some important pieces in there about racial disparities um, in, in policing and sort of how different movements have emerged to push back against that and what successes they've had. Um, and then there's also, there's some historical essays as well as essays about police technology. And, you know, when we think about policing, you know, this is an institution that has been around for quite a bit and that legacy stays with us. Um, so, you know, law enforcement was involved in the slave patrol and Jim Crow and um, lynching and sort of how does that history color our perceptions of policing today and what are the ethical responsibilities of, of police to address that. Um, and then obviously like technology is changing. So police are using drones, they're using predictive analytics um, and these are raising a, a host of new um, ethical quandaries uh, for public safety and law enforcement. So those are also issues addressed in the book. It is holistic and it is expansive, and uh, it's going to be very much on President-elect Biden's desk um, when he finally takes office here come January. Uh, I will also mention, before I wrap things up, that you've got another book coming, Apocalypse Without God, uh, Apocalyptic Thought, Ideal Politics, and the Limits of Utopian Hope, which is not about police reform, if I'm correct, right? That's um, utopian theory. So we're going to have to rejoin you on that one, I believe. It is timely, though, right, given all the apocalyptic stuff going on in 2020? <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. And I was just, uh, there was something that came out recently that uh, confirmed that dinosaurs were doing real well until they got hit by an asteroid. So, you know, apocalypse is just around the corner. So we'll be rejoining you with that book uh, probably sometime in 2021. Sounds great. Thanks so much, David. You bet, Ben. Ben Jones, the Assistant Director of the Rock Ethics Institute. We appreciate your being here. Uh, for the Rock Ethics Institute, this has been Ethics Now. I'm David Price.